after it pops up. I need a T-Mobile or a T-Mobile. I need an Audacity check. The Audacity check looks good. Twitch is live. Checking audio. Yep, we are good to go. Okay, 274, okay. <clears throat> okay, tell me when you're right. Uh, do we know if Twitch is live yet? Yep. Oop. Twitch okay. is live and good. I'm ready when you are. Okay, <clears throat> 274. I'm just, there's too many screens. Okay, three. Oh, nope, not yet. I gotta get record. I'm like looking, I'm like, where's the one thing I need? Okay. 274 and i'm forgetting that okay three two one hello oh stop 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 i'm like not in spot zero okay ready can you stop your record not this twitch but your recording okay okay three two one hello everyone welcome to episode 274 of the security podcast here on in 30 and i don't have them right now but we got HIPAA compliant stickers. If you find me, or if you're in the Signal group and you want some HIPAA compliant stickers, we have them. You want to make your mask HIPAA compliant. If you want to talk to your coworker and they say, what about HIPAA compliance? You have a sticker. We certify these stickers to be compliant. If you would like to make your you Raspberry could... Pi based Game Boy platform HIPAA compliant, you can with a HIPAA compliant sticker. So, so if you get into our signal group, we will send you some HIPAA compliant stickers because I had to order way more than I needed to. Anyway, who this you is heard clear. was Tom. This is clear on stream, apparently, for some reason. So, it's yellow. It's not so, green. I don't know why it's showing up clear. Oh, no, no. I saw it as yellow. Okay. Who you're hearing is Tom over there showing off his new uh, play thing. Is that what it's called? So this is the uh, this is the Pi Boy DMG. It's quite literally a very fancy Raspberry Pi case. Uh, you can put anything in it from a Pi Zero all the way up to a Pi Four B Plus. Uh, that's what I'm running right now, and uh, it's it's a Game Boy. It's a Raspberry Pi in a Game Boy case. So if you would like to load up your completely legal homebrew and play video games on it, yeah. So that's really interesting, but that's for that's for uh, Raspberry Pi Game Boy related podcast. That's yep. not this, but exactly. anyway, <laughs> if you want to do it again, we're uh, join the Signal Group. We will tell you. So, so lots of so we we weren't we didn't record for a while, but we got two really big story or one really big story and one medium sized story that we've we've beaten like a dead horse at this point, but. I think we're going to start with T-Mobile, right? So hackers basically lifted the entirety of T-Mobile's everything, every all the customer records, everything. Uh, past, present, future customer. I don't know about future, but if you were ever a T-Mobile customer, if you're a Sprint customer, and maybe if you were an AT&T customer at some point during that weird merger phase, we don't know, but it looks like everybody, everything got stolen. and. And the problem with that is what you're going to see in a few minutes is is what we're going to call a SIM swap attack. But that that's a big problem. So the very first thing is your data got stolen and you're saying like, oh, who really cares? Well, that's not the issue. It's an issue to begin with. And now people are going to try and impersonate. But the real hardship is um, we use our phones to authenticate ourselves. And the problem with that is is now they have the method to change your phone number. And that is the inherent problem. So I'm going to let Tom take it away a little bit to fill in some of those details. Yeah, so um, standard data breach stuff, again, have fun, enjoy some credit monitoring or something. Uh, yeah, uh, first and last names, dates of birth, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, the, the whole deal. Uh, stolen from T-Mobile. Um, so this news story broke, and then a few days later, and I'm honestly surprised it took a few days, uh, of course, I got uh, a note or a text from T-Mobile saying, hey, we, we compromised all your data. Sorry. Um, I, I'm kind of at a loss, uh, as, as we have been for, for a while in all of these, uh, <laughs> all of these data breaches. 
uh, of what to do, how to respond, and what you can do to prevent it. And frankly, um, it's not really a, a whole lot other than uh, finding a nice cave to live in and not interacting with modern society in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so aside from that very stellar security advice, uh, T-Bubble is immediately offering two years of identity theft protection. Um, they uh, recommend that all T-Mobile postpaid customers uh, go and change their PIN. Um, they, they don't know that PINs were compromised, but they want to do it out of an abundance of caution. Cool, good advice. If there's a breach or if you suspect any information was compromised, rotating credentials is always a good thing to do. Um, they are offering an extra step to protect your account. Um, I don't know what that extra step is. They're not really going into it, but okay. Uh, and they are publishing uh, a web page uh, for one -stop, uh, a one-stop shop for information and solutions uh, to help customers further protect themselves. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in other news, there was a rumor that AT&T also got hacked and also had a bunch of data leaked. Um, which we know the data was out there, but AT&T said they weren't breached. And the hacker was trying to get in touch with AT&T to, I guess, negotiate payment to avoid releasing this data uh, or redacting it. So we don't really have great sources on whether or not that's accurate. Um, but AT&T denies up and down that they were hacked. Uh, we do know that, yes, T-Mobile was completely compromised. So... I wish I had better advice here, but hey, another data breach. Well, well I mean, so that that's what we talk about. Okay, there's a data breach. So at this point, unfortunately, it I mean, it's j we're jaded at this point. We're saying, hey, oh wow, another data breach. These data breaches shouldn't happen, but they do. And and I mean, we understand. We we're intelligent enough to understand that it's it's secure. It's it's secured, but there are humans there and everything else. Like, we get that. But the problem with cell phone carriers is they require so much information to get you started, and they have it. Like, I don't understand why. I'm, I've am i been a T-Mobile customer probably for 10 years now. I mean, it's a very, very long time. And at this point, why are we they – they should have purged my driver's license. We're, we're a good-paying customer for X number of years, purges – Purge the information that you need. What, what do they need my driver's license for? Um, the, my biggest problem is they use they use social security numbers as their way as the pin, and that in conjunction with with the fact that that is the lowest that is that is the backup method for everything. It doesn't matter what you do because if you just say I don't have it, I don't have it, I don't remember it, I can't remember it. This, that, the other thing, I'm stuck. I have 3% on my battery life. I'm at the airport. I really need help. My phone broke. Uh, I have a screaming baby. All all those clever social engineering hacks. At the very end, they're going to say, okay, what's your social security number? You're going to, and you're going to get it because you can just buy it now on the black market and you can get into somebody's account. And you're going to be like, okay, so what are they going to do? Well, the next thing is we, we've spoken about SIM swap attacks. They say, hey, I need a new SIM card for the phone they get mailed or they they go to it gets mailed to them and then the next day they're resetting all your your other codes all your other your banking information that sends a text message that sms hack that's the problem that's the thing that i don't know how to stop now i was telling to, uh, tom pre-show i don't pay my t-mobile bill i am not the primary account holder so now I have to find that person and I have to explain all of this to them on why they need to go to an actual store. So before all this happened, because I'm the resident tech guru, I called T-Mobile and said, what can we do? And first they denied, we don't know if your information got hacked because it was before everything got hacked. Um, then they said, well, we're, we're trained in this. I said, how do you prevent a SIM swap attack? They said, well... Um, we ask for your password. We ask for this. We generally listen to your voice. I said, what does listening to your voice mean? Well, we're trained in understanding what a respectable person is. I didn't want to get into it with the person. The person on the other line was really trying to, to read the script. Yeah, I mean, they were really trying to say like, hey, like we understand if somebody's nervous or a different language. Okay, 
and we'll get to that in a few minutes, but there are really good people out there that can do this and you're not going to be able to do it. So he goes, would you like me to help you change your pin? I just need the last four of your social. And I go, no, I don't want to give it to you because you don't know if I know it or not. I'm told you I'm not the primary account holder. I'm trying to figure out for the primary account. So if I give you something, you shouldn't let me have it. And he goes, and he said, well, I just want to verify you. We can't actually do anything until you go to the store. Okay, that's good. You have to go yep. to the store with your driver's license. Go to the store to verify. I like that. So they were starting to say the right thing. So hopefully in the next week or so, they're going to update all the CSR people to to uh, to, to what, what to do. And I think the right answer is, I think they need to drop the social security number as the pin and start reaching out to all those people who have it every time somebody calls and force them to change the pin to something with some backup and go from there as as a person who loves this new connected world who has uh you know quite literally grown up with the internet um i i love it i really do but honestly one of the best and agreed it's a high friction way to to not even prevent but to uh, it I mean, I guess prevent the, the lowest class of these attacks is, you know, hey, if you want to make these large scale changes to your account, to your payment, to your SIM, um, you can't do it remotely, right? Go to a store because at the very least, it's going to add just a little bit of friction to make those kinds of attacks a little bit harder to pull off. If somebody is targeting you and specifically you, right? If it's if it's a very targeted attack, there's not really much that you or T-Mobile can do to prevent that, right? It's it's eventually uh, going to result in a compromise. Just how targeted attacks work. Uh, if you've got you know a team of of hackers, not even nation state hackers, trying to get into one person's account, right? Um, not a ton. You can do to prevent that as an average person. Like if you're if you're Brad Pitt, if you're the president, if you're like some big known uh, you know, executive or something. Sure, there's there's ways to work within the system to protect yourself. But if you're just an average Joe like us, your options are kind of limited. But making somebody actually go to a physical location with physical security cameras. Uh, and especially in a physical area where your known blast address is, might be helpful. Now, that said, there are issues with this system. Um, I, I recently had to uh, put off uh, signing some bank paperwork because the bank said, oh, yeah, we're, we refuse to do this uh, over the phone or online or through USPS, even certified mail for security reasons, which A, is respectable. But B, I literally live an entire length of the country away. So I had to, uh, on my vacation to see my family, go to the bank to do this paperwork because they refused to do it otherwise. Which, okay, fine. Very inconvenient for me, but also extremely inconvenient for people who aren't me. Uh, which is nice. Um, so yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how T-Mobile responds to it. And really, in, in the wider scheme of things, you know, these data breaches are... Dime a dozen. Ransomware attacks. Dime a dozen, which we're going to get into. Um, they happen all the time, and something's got to give. We can't keep going on like this. I mean, that's the, really the next topic. Um, my problem is not just the data breaches, but we're going to give you two years of free credit monitoring. We, we've spoken about this, how completely useless most of them are. Um, Freezing your credit, I think, is the right answer. Remember, TransUnion lost all our data with, with actual data, like really hard data, and they're still litigating this, and nothing is happening. I'm not getting my $125. I'm not getting anything. I don't even think I'm getting the free credit monitoring service because I said I have my own to get the $125, and they're not giving that either. I don't, I, I don't have much stock in free credit monitoring service. Take it. They're giving it to you. Maybe something. Hopefully nothing happens. I guess the best thing to do is call up T-Mobile, tell them you're the primary account holder and follow their guidance on what to do. It probably involves going to a store or going somewhere. And I, th I, 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 I don't know this, but they're, they, they own Metro PCS. 
So maybe you can go to a Metro PCS store if that's near you. They're probably looking for some sort of verif. They want to verify that you're you before they allow you to make make uh, account changes. I guess. So that's another thing. Check your check your credit report. I mean, because they do have your social security number. They do have your driver's license. I don't know if I would go so far as to, uh, what's it called, to freeze your credit. But if you don't need any more credit, you're not opening credit cards, you're not doing this, that, you're not getting cars, you're not getting mortgages, That like that's where I fall in. It may not be the worst idea to freeze your credit um, or freeze one of them, freeze one of the big ones and figure out what the credit cards use to check that because maybe if you freeze one they'll hit the luck you'll there's a one third chance that a bad actor will hit the wrong one and then it gets frozen and there's a problem anyway i think that's it i i don't know what else to say other than if you're really scared i will be going to i will be taking my dad to the t-mobile store next time i see him and we will have to figure out a pin and then write it down and everything else because it is really easy to know the last four or or know your last of your social and go from there because everyone knows that it's harder when the pin changes and and then you have to remember did i change this pin or did i not change this pin anyway last statements on this yeah, I. It's kind of infuriating to me because you know we, uh, we we try to give advice to everyday people on how to respond to security issues, how to keep themselves safe, and in situations like this, there's we're we're powerless. Like, what what do we tell people? I, I wish I had anything useful to give you on this, except watch your credit. Maybe take advantage of the free credit monitoring and freeze it if you can, but that, that's all I got. That's, There's that's nothing it. else. Yeah. So this leads us into another ransomware story. Um, if you've never watched Last Week Tonight, that's on HBO. It's John Oliver. They have a 22-minute segment where he goes into some deep dive into something, whatever it is. And... Mo- they're they're generally hits most of the time all the information is presented accurately um there are some times where if you're an expert in the subject like we're going to talk about you you want to yell at the tv and say you're missing this really key point that's the good thing about this is you don't have to subscribe to hbo if you go to the last week tonight youtube site they will they will have this list so they talk about coronavirus they talk about ransomware which we're going to talk about they talk about jails they talk about a lot of weird things that you're like hmm i never thought of this uh and they they do it in a comedic slant but they are very serious and they've won emmys and uh news awards and everything else for i'm not going to say that john that that john oliver is straight down the center he's he 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 does lean very left but that's not a political, I mean, politically, that's what he is. But for the most part, on these non-political topics, um, he, they do a very decent job. So they had, last week, they had they talked about ransomware and what it is. And they correctly identified Colonial Pipeline. They correctly identified um, the, the company behind it. Ransomware as a service. They correctly identified uh, Kaseya, which was recent. They, they, they... It's how easy it is to do it and the little things to do. My very big issue was the very end, the points they made, one of them being two-factor authentication, didn't really solve the problem. And I think that's what we want to hit on really hard. So you want to add into anything before we continue? Yeah, I, I think you, you set it up perfectly. Um, so, so the advice that John Oliver gave at the end of that segment was the Right. Um, let's let's go into the two things that are, are really key and really helpful, which uh, it's going to sound extremely familiar if you've ever listened to this show before. Um, so keep things up to date. Right. Install your updates, whether it's on your phone, your computer, your game consoles, your your Raspberry Pi based video game Game Boy systems. Install your updates. Cool. That's great. Uh, because if there's an exploit that's going to get into your system, wreak havoc. You know, updates and security patches aren't the best first line of defense against that, um, right? Bug fixes are bug fixes for a reason. Um, you know, the other thing, don't click on links in suspicious email. Well, let's expand that, right? Don't click on suspicious links anyway. If you, uh, if you get a random Facebook message that says, oh, hey, you have to download this update to Flash Player. A, 
no one uses Flash Player anymore. It is literally dead. Macromedia or, or Flash. <laughs> Adobe has killed Flash. Um, and and B, uh, just don't don't click suspicious links. You you don't need to install like a, an update to your Flash Player from a Facebook link. That's not how things work. Um, right? If you get a random Twitter DM from a bot, especially like a, a really attractive person who's asking you out on a date, don't. It's a bot. They're trying to scam. Um, but the, the third thing is enable multi-factor authentication, which we have covered a lot in the show, which on one hand is great general security, right? Uh, if you're using a weak password or for whatever reason, your password gets compromised or somebody ends up, you know, brute forcing their way into an account, multi-factor authentication can really save you a major headache by preventing that attack, uh, or at least, you know, making it significantly harder for the attacker get in but when it comes to ransomware except in a few cases where you're actually protecting like the door to a network like a vpn right which was the the specific example here multi-factor authentication doesn't really prevent most end user ransomware uh, generally end user ransomware is something where you're gonna get one of those like fake facebook messages or emails you're gonna click on something you're going to run a file um, and yeah, it turns out that that thing's going to run in your user context and encrypt all of your data that you have access to. Um, multi-factor authentication doesn't really come into play there. If you are downloading the virus and double-clicking it yourself and running it yourself on your own computer, you're not really logging into anything. There's no real authentication barrier there because you are the user in the context that that application is running. Um, you know, great general security advice, but multi-factor authentication isn't necessarily going to prevent most end-user forms of ransom, which is, you know, regular people forms of ransom. Look, it's, um, I've been getting a lot of cash app, uh, spam, uh, spam through my Gmail. You have just won X number of dollars through cash app. And I look at it and it really, I, it looks legitimate. Like it really looks legitimate. The way I can tell it's immediately not legitimate is they don't put my correct username or my correct name. They they grab it from the email. They do some weird mail merge. There's some weird special characters before and after. And then when you look at the email itself, when you look at the headers, the the it's not from Cash App or Square or whoever. I don't know who owns Cash App at this point. Probably the same with Venmo. Um, so so it's one of those things. That, Ask yourself, does this make sense that I'm receiving this? And with that said, I have gotten potential phishing attacks for things I, I am trying to receive, class rosters or some newsletter or whatever it is. And you have to ask yourself, who is this person sending? I know my, corp my company uses uh, capital letters for everyone's name in the organization. I, th then they stop doing that. So some people have capital letters, some people don't. But I, I like that. There's some sort of... Uh, consistency across that I wish they would keep. The other one, the other one was the stupid yellow box that says this is from an external sender, which does absolutely nothing except piss me off. But you real the point is you really have to check these things. Hold on a second. Wow, all of a sudden, like all of a sudden I had to drink something. It's crazy. All of a sudden you have to you have to check all these things. And like and if something happens a ransomware attack will get there. And and remember, the attackers have to hit one person in the entire organization. So a security person has to protect everyone in the organization at all times. An attacker has to hit one person once. So that's the problem. And so the next step is, how do you protect yourself? And they go through, John Oliver doesn't really go through. I, I think with ransomware, the best thing is backups. I mean, that's really the only thing. You yeah. have a backup or you... And it's it's disconnected. So you need like, when we always talk about three backups. You need three backups, two different mediums, one off-site. And one of those mediums need to be not always connected. So you do your Friday night backup, time machine backup, or whatever it is. Or use some cloud storage like Dropbox or uh, Microsoft uh, 360, uh, OneDrive or Google Drive, because they can go back with that. And if Google gets hit with ransomware, there are way bigger problems right now. Um, there, so, or Dropbox or Microsoft or any of the others. 
So if you're working on something, start putting it in there. Start putting it into some some um, redundant cloud storage solution that does also version control that lets you go back and back and back and back. That's how they're going to protect you. Uh, in the story, they talk about customer records. You you're you don't have customer records. I mean, they're you're not the fish they're frying, and they're not looking for you there. They're looking at getting all the T-Mobile data and saying if you don't pay us, we're going to leak your customer database. But they they use they they conflate the the two wrong ideas. If a ransomware, the way to stop it is by backing up, uh, to to protect yourself from other things, multi-factor authentication. Now, the one thing that I yelled at the TV for outside of all of this is you do not want to enable multi-factor authentication on the spur of the moment. You need to be super concentrated and you have to be thinking about what you're doing. Because basically what you're saying is you're you're taking the trust out of the provider and putting it into yourself. If you don't know what you're doing, the company can't help you. Maybe they can, but realistically they can't. So by by doing this quickly on your couch or whatever it is, with not thinking what you're doing, not taking the code, not writing down the code, not taking a screenshot of the code, doing it on something and you don't know what you're doing or you didn't hit save can cause real problems. And we've always said this, don't just enable multi-factor right now. Say to yourself, I'm going to be completely focused to do this because if you do it spur of the moment without thinking or without understanding, you will have problems. Right. Well, a lot of a lot of applications will walk you through a process of okay, you've enabled two factor, kind of right. You're you're halfway through the process, but we're going to make sure that you have backup codes and make sure those are saved. Don't click past those, right? Use your password managers, copy stuff, paste stuff in your password manager. Make sure you've got that locked up. If if you really want to get uh, get serious about it, you can print out those backup codes. Don't even keep them in electronic medium, right? Print out the backup codes laminate it throw it in a safety deposit box got them right there right make sure to, to write down what site it's for you don't want a pile of random codes that you have to try hundreds of them. um but uh a lot of apps will walk you through the okay now that you've got backup codes we're gonna make you put in like two of these uh, like six digit numbers in the case of like google authenticator we're, we're gonna make sure that you've got it before we we finally flip the switch all the way to multi-factor authentic which is great but there are some sites out there, and I've, I've actually uh, run into a few of these myself, where they say, cool, just scan this code, you're already set. If you close that tab, like, it, it, that's it. <laughs> you've, you've now multifactored yourself out of your own account, which isn't great. Um, so make sure to pay attention. Don't do it spur of the moment. Uh, if you have a password manager or a way to securely back up and store this type of data, do that. Um, but what you said about backups is entirely right. Uh, I once had a, uh, a job interview at a, uh, an InfoSec company where the interviewer asked, okay, what's your plan to prevent ransomware? And my answer was, you don't. It runs in the context of an end user. It attacks everything they have access to, which could be a little bit. It could be a lot, depending on the user. And ultimately, the only thing you can control for ransomware is how you respond to it. And the best way to respond to it is quick and easy backups. Make sure the backups are versioned. Make sure the backups themselves can't be uh, quickly and easily compromised by ransomware themselves, right? There's, there's nothing worse than having a folder labeled backups on your desktop that then gets encrypted by ransomware, right? That does nobody any good. Uh, my personal backup solution is I've got an external hard drive here. I turn it on every uh, every day. It doesn't even automatically mount. Now, this might be a little technical, but I have a, a script set up to automatically uh, mount this encrypted backup drive, run the backup, and unmount and kick itself out of my system. So it's not, it's still connected, right? There's a point in time where it's connected but not mounted. But I also have a separate uh, cloud backup service that I use that runs once a night and backs up everything and keeps version information. Like I've, I've got backups going years at this point with this setup um, and it works great. So yeah, you, we can talk all day long about, oh, you got to do backups. And you know, you're probably sitting there at home thinking, yeah, I, I could, but like, I don't need it right now. The issue with backups is you won't need it ever until you do and then it's too late to have so do yourself a favor set it up ahead of time 
Um, because you will need it eventually. If not due to any like anything serious or crazy, like a computer crash or a dead hard drive or a ransomware attack, uh, even just human stupidity. I have absolutely deleted files and I later went, oh no, I lost that thing. I deleted that folder. I thought it was temporary. I had it in the wrong spot. Oh, where did oh I've got it in backups. Okay, cool. I could just pull this back. Um, so having backups uh, to even just protect against your own human stupidity, uh, like it has saved me countless times, is a great idea. And again, if you don't want to go that route, pay for the extra on whatever cloud storage, iCloud, Google Drive, whatever it is. Um, that's the cheapest way. It, it could be mounted, it could not be mounted, but that respective company is going to handle it. And if they get in trouble, there's a way bigger problem than your stuff at that moment. So the other thing, the other thing I got a little annoyed at the video about is, well, not necessarily at John Oliver, but in general. So in the InfoSec communities, people are talking about SMS two factor is terrible. It is SMS two factor is terrible, but for different reasons. So when Tom and I talk about it being terrible, it's because it's very weak. There are ways to get that to get that code. And we talked about a SIM swap attack 15 minutes ago where you can pretend to be T-Mobile and get that. Realistically, you, me, 99% of the people, if you have that turned on and they text message you the code, nobody's the wiser, no one's gonna care. Even if someone's trying to attack you, that code is gonna stop 99% of those attackers. What we're talking about is those really high targeted people, individuals, the president, the DNC, the RNC, uh, celebrities, where people are going to try to SIM swap. They are going to try and do it. And getting a swim, uh, SIM swap attack is not that hard. And that's why the six digit codes are always better. The, the only thing worse than SMS-based two-factor authentication is not having two-factor authentication. So if that's your only option, and I, I trust me, there's a lot of places, a lot of services that I personally use where they don't offer Google Authentic. They don't offer FIDO2. They don't offer U2F. They don't offer anything except, uh, I don't know, plug in your phone number. We'll send you a code. It's better than nothing. That's the best you can say about it. But hey, it is better than nothing. So if it is an option, even if it's the only option, you should just enable it. Yeah, it's annoying. Yeah, I understand. I don't want to have to grab my phone either or fiddle with my watch to get the code. It's, it's a pain. But a bigger pain is trying to deal with the account breach, which I have helped countless friends and family members through. And trust me, you don't want to be that person. You, you don't want to be on the receiving end of a successful. The, the problem is, is that not that it, you can do this on a Saturday morning or uh, <clears throat> you wake up Monday morning and you're off from work and you're logging into Facebook and something happens and you have all day. Or it's like your car breaks down. It's really, it's mildly annoying that something's up. But if your mechanic's there, you have to take off a day of work and that's, that's fine. No, if this happens, it never happens like that at the, such convenience. It's usually when you're late on a deadline, you're doing work. So it's Friday, five o'clock and you have to get something and everything piles on and you have this and they got into your account and they did this and they did that. So it's never the one thing that hurts you. It's the aggregate of everything just piling on. So, yep. So I, again, so just to recap, because we're over time, um, T-Mobile, they got hacked. You got hacked. Sorry, we can't really help you. Check, check uh, the mail, check your credit, check, just be vigilant. Go to T-Mobile, see what you can do. And I do recommend you actually going to T-Mobile and changing your PIN code from your social security number. Like that, that I do recommend. That will save and tell them, do not allow anyone to use my social. That's going to take you 99% of the way there. Um, with ransomware, <clears throat> backups, that's the only way. And we've spoken about this countless times. If you uh, with John Oliver saying, turn on multi-factor. Yes, but not because of ransomware, but because that's really good. And we talked about how T-Mobile now can get those SMS codes. You may want to work on turning on multi-factor with the six digit Google Authenticator app or a different type of one. There's a whole bunch, but that's what we got for this week. So 
And or uh, we, or you can you can Shrew. get you can get one of these uh, cheap little guys, one of these one of these Yuba keys. Or I know Google's got the the Titan key. There's there's a bunch of these little hardware tokens that are even better than Google Authenticator. And I have a, I have and a Titan key somewhere. Lazier, they are so much lazier. Do you do you know what's better? Because you can you can get like the little nano ones that just stick in your computer and you never have to worry about them again. Yeah, you're taking up a USB port, but. You know what's better than looking through your phone and scrolling through the hundreds of accounts on Google Authenticator that you have? Just slapping the side of your computer when you want to log in. A, it's safer. Like, way, way more secure. Uh, it's unfishable for FIDO2 U2F because it does do endpoint validation and verification. It's really cool tech. Um, and B, it's just lazy. It's so much lazy. I absolutely love my Ubiquiti. Um, the, so, the problem yeah. is, are the companies who don't have it. The problem right. is that not every company has it yet, yeah. and and that's the problem, and that's always going to be the problem. But maybe it's not. I, I think you're right. Giving everyone a YubiKey here, this twenty five dollar little thing is everywhere. No more passwords. You just stick it in, and that's it. You have two of them, one as a backup, and you go from there. Maybe you put a pin code in. And that could be your social because it doesn't matter because you still need to have the YubiKey at the end of the day. So with that said, we are way over time. So we're going to end. Uh, and I'll just say join our signal group and we will talk to everyone hopefully next week. So bye, everybody. See ya.